Praise the Lord, everybody. Let's all stand. Why don't we just take a moment? Why don't we just take a moment and lift up our hands and magnify the Lord? In the name of Jesus, God, we magnify you. And we love you today. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for an awesome service this morning to be in the spirit of liberty and freedom and victory, Lord. We magnify you and we exalt you today, God. And we come to offer up the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. My soul will bless the Lord. Thank you for a revelation and understanding of your word today. Thank you for helping us, God, to grow in you and the knowledge of you. We magnify you. We glorify you. We love you in this place. You are amazing and mighty. And we give you glory this morning, this afternoon. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Everybody say amen. Come on, clap your hands. Here we go. I am free. I am free.
Cause no more chains, no more shackles, no more chains, no more shackles, no more chains, no more shackles, no more chains. Here we go. No more shackles, no more chains, no more bondage. I am free. Yeah. Here we go. Sing hallelujah. magnify your name God come on lift up your hands for just one more moment let's just worship the king of kings and the lord of lords we magnify your name God you're worthy Jesus your presence is heaven to me Lord Jesus, your presence is a present, God, and we thank you for it in this place tonight, God. Hallelujah, your presence is heaven to me. Hallelujah, we worship you, God. Let's sing this together, verse 1. Who is like you, Lord? Who is like you, Lord? Matchless love, matchless love and beauty in this world. Nothing in this world, Nothing in this world can Cause Jesus, you're the cup. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is singing. Your presence. There's nothing like your presence, Jesus. Your presence is heaven to me. Let's do verse 2. He's the treasure of my heart. Treasure of my heart and of my soul. In my weakness, your mercy. In my weakness, you are merciful. Redeemer of my past. Redeemer of my past and present Oh, holder, holder of my future days. Your presence is heaven.
Verse 3, let's sing that together. We love you, Jesus. Here we go. All my days, all my days on earth, I will love you. The moment that I see your face. Thank you, thank you. Nothing in this world can satisfy Cause Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Let's sing that again from the top. All my days, all my days on earth, I will away. That's what I'm waiting for, that moment. about this morning that somebody made up for us and we appreciate that and uh, I want you to be able to um, underline some of this and particularly verse 17 could I get some scripture on there verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you Everybody say, give unto me. He wants to give something to you. He wants to give you the spirit of wisdom. We make too many mistakes because we don't have wisdom. And so the spirit of wisdom is what God knows, and he imparts what he knows to you. That's the, the spirit of wisdom. And revelation, the word revelation simply comes from the word to reveal. God wants to reveal. So I'd like you to underline that whole uh, script, uh, verse there, the revelation of the knowledge of him. 
There's so much more. My wife and I have been married now uh, 44 years, baby. 45. 45? 45? Are you that old? 45. That's amazing. But I am learning so much more about her just because I guess we're in this state of our lives. But I'm learning more and more and more what a smart choice I made. And all, all the ladies say, the ladies say amen. amen. And this is how Jesus wants us to desire to know him. And the only way he can help you know him is by you seeking him and opening your heart to receive. And it's so easy for us, especially if you've been around for a while, to just feel like you've got it all together, you know enough. But there's way more to experience. And so he wants us to have this eyes being opened and enlightened. That's just so powerful. So please circle that. And the first verse, wherefore I also, after I heard that your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto most of my friends. Is that what it says? No. That the love unto all the saints. If you have a problem with somebody here, you need to go work it out lovingly, not by saying, this is what you did. That's not how you do it. He ceases not to give thanks to you, making mention in you in my prayers. And then we get to that scripture. So I'd like us to be on the same page. I'm going to put this out to the whole body in um, um, not text, the other one, email. email. And let's all focus and make this a part of our prayer. And we had a little thought out there in the prayer hall, and we talked about knowing the Word and reading the Word. Why didn't Gideon freak out when God took away 30,000 people and left him with 30? How could he stand up unto that? And here's how he did. And here's how you are going to do. He knew what God had said, that God was going to give him a victory. God could have took it down to zero, and Gideon would still have won that battle because he knew the Word. The reason so many Christians fail is because they fail because of a lack of knowledge. We cannot fail because of that. We've got to know the Word. He knew what God had said, and God used that as a great victory. But if you don't know what he's saying, you could fall for anything. So I'm really encouraged about us moving toward a, a place of daily prayer and reading the Word. And let's use it this week and read over that and let it sink into our ears and let it become a part of us. And I'm telling you, in the zone that we're in, there's revelations for every one of us more than we could possibly know if we would just open up, open our heart, and God ask God to open your eyes. What do you want to me to see today. Does that sound like it's hard? Thank you, brother.
How about everybody else? Does that sound like it's hard? How many will commit with me to your best to get up and not go out of the house till you've prayed and inserted that phrase, help me understand and enlighten my eyes? I bet it make a big difference.
Brother Lonnie's been having some struggles a little bit. Not to put your business out there, Brother Lonnie, but are you feeling okay? He missed this morning, but let's see how good you're feeling. Can you come up and help us? <laughs> doctors play with your medication, sometimes you have uh, some setbacks. Look at him run. He's feeling real good. Let's hit it, guys. <laughs>
Yes, God. Amen. How many want the blessing? How many, how many desire the blessings of the Lord? Amen. Let's stand. Go to the word of the Lord. Amen. We want the blessings of the Lord. But we don't want to need them. We want the miracles of God, the healing of God. I don't I don't want to need them. Because that means I'm in trouble. But when I am in trouble, I'm thankful that I serve a God that, as the Bible says, is an ever-present help in the time of need. Oh, I'm thankful for that. Hallelujah. I want to depend upon Him. That's, that's a tough place to be. As it means dying out to myself and being totally dependent upon Him. And in the world in which we live, the culture in which we find ourselves, the day in which we've been called to serve Him um, is probably the... It's a very challenging to be selfless and dependent upon God. But I want to be that. I want to be that. Amen. You know what? You may be seated. The Lord is so good, isn't He? And He is so kind. And He is a righteous God, the Bible tells us. A holy God. He is a just God. He's a God that is full of mercy, a God that is full of grace, a God that has compassion, a God that shows long-suffering and kindness. These are the attributes of God, a God that extends His arm as far as He needs to extend it, in which to reach us, a God that can lift us. God that can set us on the straight path. I'm thankful for that. How about you? Are you thankful for that? Are you glad? Are you glad? And we are understanding our walk with God and our position with God needs to be understood more and more every day. I believe that there is so much that God has for each of us not only as individuals, not only as families, but also corporately as the body of Christ. That we never reach a plateau of understanding and knowledge. That's what Pastor was talking about this morning. God, increase our revelation of you in the knowledge of your name. That there is more to understand about him. And every phase of life in which we we are in, find ourselves in, there's more of God in which we can learn, and more of God in which we can partake of, and more of God in which we can allow into our being and world. And so it's an ever-increasing knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many can say that you have experienced an ever-increasing knowledge of Him just over your course of time that, that you know more about Jesus today than you did maybe when you first found Him or He found you. Come on, somebody, tell me now. Do you know? Amen. Do you feel like there's, 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 there's a, a quicker connection today than there was maybe earlier? 
you can, you can find him a lot faster. Come on, you can get into the presence of God sooner. You understand the operation of relationship in him. Come on. Are you glad about that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so we are pursuing him. We're pursuing him. When in Genesis, when he created mankind, he created mankind that we would be in perfect relationship with him. That we would walk with him. That we would talk with him in perfection. That's what the Garden of Eden was all about. It was about living in perfect relationship with their creator. And there was an enjoyment that was had between the creation and the creator. And it was enjoyment and enjoyment of perfect fulfillment. Fulfillment of the creator by his creation and a fulfillment of the creation by its creator. There was harmony and there was perfection. And that was the intent of God. There was the absence of anything that would separate humanity and deity. There was no gap in the relationship. There was no gap in the being able to communicate and touch him. There was no gap in him being able to communicate and touch them. There was a seamless interaction. Now we do read that in the cool of the day that God would walk with Adam. It would seem that maybe there was a time when he didn't walk with Adam just by virtue of those words. But we, we recognize and understand that in the absence of sin, when there is an absence of sin, there is the reality of relationship. And so we see maybe an enhancement to the perfection of relationship when he walked with them in the cool of the day. And what we find ourselves in now is recapturing that perfected relationship that God originally intended for mankind and himself. That's the journey in which we are on, is to recapture that perfected relationship state in which he desires for us to be in. That's what Paul was referring to in Philippians chapter 3, our, our verse of scripture, my verse of scripture, our verse of scripture that I read every time I preach. Uh, verse number 12 of Philippians chapter 3, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. I'm not there yet, he said, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul recognized the solution was to apprehend Jesus. The solution to his current state compared to the state that God wanted him to be in was in his side of the arena, in Paul's side of the arena. Paul said, I've got to do something now. God has already done his part. What did God already do? God came, robed himself in flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. He died on the cross. He made a provision, a way. He came not to do away with the law, but to uh, fulfill the law. No longer was there anything that had to be done by virtue of going through the process of another human being. But now we have an opportunity because of the fulfillment of, of the law through the perfect sacrifice of the lamb slain now it was completed and now we have an opportunity as the Bible says to obtain mercy and grace we can become boldly before the throne 
and we might actually apprehend that that has apprehended us. That through the result of the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection, that we now have an opportunity to regain that place of relationship that was originally intended for us. Through the operation of the death, burial, and resurrection, through repentance and baptism and the infilling of His Spirit, we can realign ourselves in that perfected relationship. It's staying in that relationship that becomes the challenge for us, for humanity. It's maintaining the relationship. There has to be something on the inside that drives an individual to maintain in order for that to be present in their life. And so we we have been endeavoring over the last little while to present principles in which we could maintain the direction, the course, in becoming more like Him. Because in becoming more like Him, we are bringing ourselves back to the original created state. We weren't supposed to die. We weren't supposed to experience death. We weren't supposed to experience pain. We weren't supposed to experience heartache. We weren't supposed to labor over the necessities of life. We were to live in harmony with both the creator and the creation. Are we living in harmony with both the creator and the creation today? The answer is no, we're not. Tomorrow morning, you'll find out very quickly that you are not living in harmony with the creation. And hopefully, you won't find out, but the reality is, is that we are not living in consistent harmony with the Creator either. And so we endeavor. We endeavor on the journey towards holiness and I hope that you've been listening to me over the last little while because holiness is not an external position holiness H holiness is a whole position W whole position it is a lifestyle of both inward and outward man not as the Bible says, Jesus spoke to a group of men. He says, you are all perfect on the outside, but you are full of dead man's bones on the inside. So you can have your stuff together on the outside, but be completely rotten on the inside. But you cannot have your stuff together on the inside and not have it together on the outside. And so we pursue this. And one of the ways that we pursue it, this purity, this lifestyle of purity, this lifestyle of, of habit, is through the habit of holiness. Everybody say the habit of holiness. The habit of holiness. How many have habits? You'll have a habit. Tonight you'll go home and you'll eat something. That's a habit. How many has that habit? How many resist that habit? Like most of them just starve, I think. The habit of holiness. The, re the reality is that the more we sin the more we are inclined to sin. Because every sin we commit reinforces the habit 
of sinning and makes it easier to sin. That's pretty deep, isn't it? It's pretty, it's pretty not. Because we recognize what habit is. Habit is defined as the prevailing disposition or character of a person's thoughts and feelings. Habits are the thought and emotional patterns that are engraved in our minds. And these internal habit patterns play just as forceful a role as external influences on our actions. In fact, they may play even a more role in our actions. Our habits are just as important to recognize as the external influences in our life. We can focus a lot on the external influences, and I hope that we do. Avoiding them, eliminating them, categorizing the right and the wrong influences, eliminating the wrong influences, bringing in the right influences, but our influences are not the only thing that is a danger to us. Our habits, our character of thought and feeling. One writer said, every lust is a depraved habit or disposition continually inclining our hearts to do evil. The Bible tells us that as unbelievers, before we met the Lord and gave our life to Him, that we gave ourselves to developing habits of unholiness, what Paul called ever-increasing Wickedness, And we'll go to this scripture in just a moment, Brother Tony, in Romans chapter 6, verse 19, but, but not right this second. Paul calls this ever-increasing wickedness. Development of habits of unholiness. Every time prior to the Lord, every time we sinned, every time we lusted, every time we coveted, every time we hated, every time we cheated, every time we lied, we were developing habits of ever-increasing wickedness. And these repeated acts of unrighteousness became habits that made us, as the Bible says, slaves to sin. Wow. Sure. But Paul declared, let's go to Romans 6 and verse 19, Paul declared this, he says, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have in times past yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, he says, now we're to give ourselves to developing habits of holiness. He says, now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. You see that verse there? He said before we would yield ourselves to uncleanness and we would add iniquity to iniquity and we would develop a habit of sin. He said now that you are washed, you are cleansed, you are filled, he said, now you have to yield your members, your body, your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. You may be seated. We are to put off our old self our sinful disposition and its habits and put on the new self 
with its character and habits of holiness. <laughs> it is a journey. Everybody say it's a journey. It's done on purpose. It's done because I want to do it. Not because it's easy to do. In a world that makes sinful habits easy, we have to yield the members of our body, servants, to righteousness. Amen. And we have to position ourselves. Position ourselves every moment for that habit of righteousness. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 7 <coughs> tells us, but refuse profane and old wise fables. And this is, this is the part here. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. In other words, he's saying train yourself in godliness. That means to discipline and structure our lives so that we develop godly habits. I also have a gym membership. Howbeit just one. And I have, am waiting to complete the contract so I can finally stop paying them to not go. Because it requires developing the habit of exercise. It doesn't just come naturally. You don't just wake up and say you want to go to the gym. You don't just wake up and say you want to run. Now, you may like running or you may like going to the gym, but you have to make yourself do it. I mean, I don't am I, am I just an oddity or is that, is that my, everybody goes to the gym? You have to train yourself and push yourself. And the thing about working out, is that then you end up with what's called muscle memory. And you have to break that in order to continue to develop the habit of exercise. Because your muscles can remember what it takes in order to lift that or push that or go that distance when you actually are not really doing your body any good. And so you have to create a habit to go past that point. Can somebody say amen? Amen. That's good. Is, is it, in, unless that's not true. And, and obviously I'm not the one that has the expertise on that. I got the expertise on having this as far as it goes but when I was going I was with a gentleman I, was, I only went to try to save him oh my lord <laughs> and trying to get a Bible study with him it didn't work <clears throat> I text him I said this is killing me I can't even button my shirt this morning It was quite a while ago. I'm, I can do it now. It's not a problem. <laughs> I can button it in the back. We ha so we have to train ourselves. And we can, get, we can get spiritual muscle memory. And I may have this a little wrong. Actually, it's not in my notes, but I think I've got this right. Is that we can automatically know how to lift our hands. And we can automatically know uh, it's Sunday and we have to look right. And it's... Uh, it's this day and we have to do, you know, do this correctly. And, and we get muscle memory. We get godliness memory. We get holiness memory. Come on. 
when it's not really a habit that we are exercising in our life, it's not training ourselves into godliness and disciplining ourselves and structuring our life that we are living godly every day and pushing ourselves. You know, if you go to the gym and you walk a mile, if that's all you do every time you go to the gym, you are hurting yourself. Because you need to be walking a mile and a half the next time. You need to be pushing yourself to the limits of your ability so that you can grow in that. Amen? Romans chapter 8, verse number 13, he speaks to us about putting off. For if we live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So he talks about these sinful habits need to be put off. Paul calls it mortifying or putting to death the deeds of the body. This is how we break sinful habits. It's done in cooperation with God's Spirit and in dependence upon Him. If we live through the Spirit, but if we, if, if we, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. We cannot do it outside of the Spirit of God. The determination and I'll not do that anymore based upon sheer human resolve has never once broken the shackles of sin. It is an impossibility for us to say, I'll never do this again. And just by pure human power, break the shackles of sin. It must be done through the Spirit. That's why there's got to be a spiritual encounter in our life every single day. That's why if, you, if you're going to go to the gym, you've you got to have some kind, of, some kind of encounter every day. It's usually done through some kind of accountability partner waking you up, calling you. We're going, right? Hey, we're going, right? No. Hey. <laughs> Very rarely. Quit calling me. Now, it is, it, it's done. It's done. There's people in this room that do it. They can do it by themselves. They've, been, they've learned how to create that accountability, self-accountability, which is what we need to have in our life in every area. But not very many people can go to the gym by themselves. It's boring. It's lonely. It's miserable. And you can, I, I went one time, I went one time and got in the parking lot and just put the seat back and went back to sleep. That was the best workout I'd ever had. <coughs> just, just to try and get back up. Just, I did that a couple times and called it, called it a day. We will never break the habit of sin by our human ability. But there are practical principles through the Word of God which we can follow to train ourselves excuse me, in godliness. The first principle is, is that habits, godly habits, are developed and reinforced by frequent repetition. Another definition of habit is a behavioral pattern acquired by frequent repetition. This is the principle underlining the fact that the more we sin, the more we are inclined to sin. But the opposite is also true. The more we say no to sin, the more we are inclined to say no to sin. Nice. Through the Spirit. We can develop positive habits of holiness. 
We can develop the habit of thinking thoughts that are pure, true, and good. We can develop the habits of prayer and meditating on the scriptures. But these habits will only be developed through frequent repetition. Good preaching. The second principle in breaking sinful habits and acquiring new habits is to never let an exception occur. When we allow exceptions in the day or in the moment, we are reinforcing old habits or else failing to reinforce the new habit. At this point, we must watch out for the uh, just this once type of thinking, which is a subtle, dangerous trap that we come up with all by ourselves. We don't need the enemy, the devil, to come up with that one. We cannot allow exceptions. Say, we cannot allow exceptions. Before uh, the Petersons took over the young adult group, I was, my wife and I were teaching the young adult group. And I was trying to instill into them some of these habits. And I said, it's amazing to me, and I will tell you, it's amazing to me that there are the big three. Everybody say the big three. Not the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. There is no three. The big three on exceptions. Are you ready? These are the most common, widely embraced exceptions to godliness. You ready? You ready to write them down? You won't have to write them down. When we're on vacation... All of a sudden, there are justified exceptions to my lifestyle of pleasing God in the way that I please God when I'm not on vacation. Oh, come on, somebody. As Brother Blandon would say, help me, Holy Ghost. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Ah. I've told you this before. I had a Facebook page for about three weeks. It's still out there. I tr I, you can't get rid of it. I've tried. Can't get rid of it. And I purposely titled an album of pictures, Family Vacations. All my other stuff that I posted, would not. it got hits and, and likes and, and whatever, uh, traffic, but when I put family beach vacations, I got more traffic to that album than I did on anything else. <coughs> Mostly because everybody thinks about their own page, that it's private and nobody in the world looks at it, except they think that they're the only ones that nobody looks at because they look at everybody else's page because they know that they think that nobody looks at them. You get that? It's the biggest lie deception in the whole universe that nobody will ever look at the pictures that I post that are embarrassing, which is why I post them. And so... I feel like that when we go on vacation, I feel like that I would not be or should not be embarrassed if I ran into you. Yeah. 
that if I'm at the top of a mountain skiing, I'm at the bottom of the valley swimming. That if you walked around the corner and came face to face with me, that I would not be embarrassed. Good speaking, man. Because there are no exceptions. <laughs> now, if I rent a house that has a pool, don't be jumping over the fence and coming in my private property. Just like, don't come on up in my house. without knocking. Do you understand? Vacations. The second one is when family's in town. All kind of justified exceptions happen when family shows up. It got, don't get quiet on me. <clears throat> These are the big three. These are, these are the big three. Do you still go to church? Um, it, it would be holiness to go to church whether they wanted to go to church <laughs> or not. It? If they don't want to go to church with you, they don't have to go to church with you. Unless they just did not know that you went to church. <laughs> they shouldn't be surprised when you go to church. <laughs> they don't want to come, we'll see you in 45 minutes. And so enough on that. The third, buckle up, is when... You get married. Justifiable exceptions. Talk about the third. I, when I got married, um, I had to travel down to Louisiana because that's where I found my bride. Louisiana. And, well, my Lord, have mercy. Getting married is not justifiable exceptions to how we live. How we dress, what we make up with. Can somebody say amen? Can the whole body say amen? If we don't wear things normally, there's no justification on a special occasion. This is not new tonight. This I have been teaching the young adults for years. So I'm not just bringing this out. Oh, example, example. Everybody with me? I still want an example. Pastor does not understand what I'm saying. So when we allow ex exceptions, when we allow them, what we're doing is we're feeding the wrong part of us. We're feeding the ungodliness, habits of this world, 
and we are failing to reinforce new ones. Right? We're falling, you're supposed to brush your teeth. Twice. You have to, you have to sing it twice. And it's inconvenient, but it is a habit that must be developed. I don't know, come on, somebody. The same kind of habit that when you send your kid, and I remember doing this, uh, you know, you go in and, and they say, go wash your hands. And so you go in and you just run the water. And then you turn it off. Right? How many, how many did that? Yeah, come on, just admit it. It's okay. There was something on the inside of you that says, I will not wash my hands. I don't want to wash my hands. <laughs> Do you know how much effort? It takes to get the soap out and then dry your hands, and it's a big deal, and it's a pain in the neck, and I'm just not going, shh, yeah. la, 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 shh. <laughs> All done. Yes or no? Or how many, how many know somebody in your family that took a shower and didn't use soap? Did you use soap? Did you use soap? Did you take a shower? Yes, I took a shower. Did you use soap? Why? Didn't we? Yes, of course I used soap. Did you use? Come here, let me smell you. <laughs> Dressed for bed, and just the top of the head wet, and a complete band that is dry and you go tell me you use soap and shampoo this is nobody in my family don't look at people in my family these are stories that I have read and what do we tell them get back in the shower and use soap Why? Because you're trying to develop a habit in their life of every time you take a shower, you use soap. That's why you're in there. You're not in there to get wet. You're in there to get clean. Why do you think I sent you in there? <laughs> And so, as parents, we train our children on how to take care of themselves. Now, the only reason that we as parents would not reinforce holiness habits in our children's lives is because we aren't convinced about them ourselves. The only reason you would not send your child back to use toothpaste, how many has ever gone in and felt the bristles on the toothbrush? You did not brush your teeth. Yes, I did brush my teeth. No, you did not brush your teeth. How can you have a dry toothbrush when you brush your teeth? I dried it off afterwards. The only reason you would not send them back to use toothpaste is because you're not convinced using toothpaste is such a good idea yourself. Well, 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 well. But because you are convinced, mom and dad, that using toothpaste is a good idea, and because you are convinced that using soap and shampoo is the right thing to do, and because you are convinced that having clean clothes to wear is important, and because you are convinced that having a clean room and clean dishes are important, you send them back over and over and over again. And your hope is, your goal is, that when they get married, they are not an utter embarrassment to you. Right? 
you don't say things to your new son or daughter-in-law, well, it's your time to raise them now. <laughs> Good luck. Because we are unwilling to pay the price of saying no to our desires, we tell ourselves that we will indulge only once more, and tomorrow will be different. But what we are doing is reinforcing old habits in our life and failing to reinforce new habits in our life. I encourage you, mom and dad, I encourage you to get sold out on how to live for God. And I encourage you that just like you address brushing teeth, and just like you address using soap, to put just as much emphasis on choices about living for God as you do on choices about body cleanness. The third principle. Uh, Can we go over to the marriage, the getting married thing? Oh, my God. It's just an example. I think that I'm, I believe that everyone is smart enough to understand what I mean when I say there are no exceptions on vacations, there are no exceptions when family's in town, and there are no exceptions when you get married. You're talking about a wedding. Yes. It's not just being married. A wedding. We don't, we don't consume alcohol as Christians. Period. We don't even do it in the most, uh, what religious circles would say would be the most opportune time to do it. Would be a communion. Because it's still wrong. It's still wrong. We don't even, in my house, you ready for this one? Now, we're like robots, right? We live a life that no one else can live because we are pastors. And it's easier for us. We don't even cook with it. Oh, pastor, that stuff burns out. You're right. We don't, we don't dance at our, honey, did we dance at our wedding? <sighs> Baby, did we do the traditional first dance? We did the hokey pokey. We didn't do the hokey pokey. We didn't, we didn't do the hokey pokey. We didn't do anything that would resemble. Oh, now don't. Come on now. It's just fun. Right? This is, this, is, uh, this is when you vote me out. Because there is no exception. There is no tradition. There is no exception regardless of the occasion or the celebration. There is no, that's, that's what God was trying to tell the children of Israel when they were going into the promised land. He's saying, I don't want you mixing with the populations that you are conquering. 
Because if you mix with them, you're going to take on some of their attributes and some of their mannerisms and some of their ways and eventually start serving their gods. That's what it says. And they did. And they did it anyway. Let's destroy them. And you, the, whole, the whole rest of the, the well, psh, my goodness, they, God had to come himself to fix everything. Anyway, I think you got the point. It's, it's important for us to develop habits of self-control over our physical appetites. We may think that indulging these appetites isn't so bad, but such indulgences weakens our wills in every other respect of our lives. Break this down. And so we have to be purposeful. 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 That who I am is who I am regardless of where I am. And what I'm doing, I am a child of the king. I'm chosen. I'm peculiar. I'm royal. That's right. We need to talk about that. We need to understand what those things mean to us and how, how they are applied to our life and what actions then are presented as a result of being peculiar, and as a result of being a royal priesthood, as a result of being a chosen generation. You may be seated. The last habit, and, and we're coming to a close and it's, it's late. The last habit, uh, the, the development for these habits is don't be discouraged by failure. There's a vast difference between failing and becoming a failure. That's right, that's good. We become a failure when we give up and we stop trying. But as long as we're working on these sinful habits, regardless of how often we fail, we have not become a failure and we can expect to see progress in our life if we go back to the punching bag again and we work at it again and we work at it again and we work at it again and we develop habits that are godly. It is in vain to guard our minds and emotions against that which comes from without if we do not do at the same time the same thing and deal with the habits of sin which are coming from within. It is an impossibility to say no to sin that's coming at us if we don't have what it takes in the spirit to say no to sin that is coming from within us. Does that make sense? If you can't get rid of your TV, it's not because you're, you are being controlled from the outside. It's you're being controlled from the sin on the inside. And you can't even begin to deal with that sin on the outside. Oh, man. That's a good point. That's powerful. The battle for holiness must be fought on two fronts. It must be fought from without. And we must, as individuals, as parents, families, and as a church, we must fight against the sin that comes from without. But we also must fight against the sin that comes from within. Those desires, those fleshly desires that rise up on the inside of us. Those emotions that overtake us, pride and anger and lust and hatred, we got to kill that stuff and we've got to subdue those things and we got to create habits that suppress that and kill it and mortify the deeds of the body. Can somebody say amen? 
then we can deal with that sin on the outside because if I don't have those sinful, lustful desires being birthed from the inside, I'm not going to desire and make a connection with those things on the outside. Very true, very good. So we can kill all day long that stuff on the outside, but if we're not dealing with the stuff on the inside, they'll always find a way back into our lives because there's familiarity and connection and opportunities and the ability to slide back once again into that life. Only when we hit both of those fronts, without and within, only then will we see progress towards living a holy and pure relationship that God originally intended us to live in Him. Let's stand. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Clear word. God is calling us. I made a, made a proclamation when we started 2014, and I made it in faith. I said that 2014 was going to be our rebuilding year so that 2015 could be our revival year. And I did not take into consideration and calculation the amount of change that occurred through our transition process. And I fear that maybe we haven't crossed that bridge fully in redeveloping ourselves, so that we are not totally in position for the revival that God would have for Christian Life Center. My son works at Chick-fil-A they, in, in Frederick, and uh, they had a little uh, Christmas gathering today. How many know that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays, right? Is there anybody in the universe who does not know that Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays? But it's funny watching the amount of people that would come up to those doors and try to get in. As a matter of fact, two people did come in, and they had to weave their way through a ping-pong table, through beanbag toss, and four tables of ham, potatoes, yams, potato salad, and stuff for the party. And they, they, they went by it, and they went up to the cash register that's full of stuff for the party, and were contemplating the menu. <laughs> And I, I told one of the workers, I said, you just should have said, it's $9 for the buffet. And we're only taking cash. It's a special day. <laughs> but everywhere we, everywhere we go, we should be eliciting, comp, you know, um, it just ran from this part of my head all the way around to this part of my head I can't reach it interest and so obviously I'm dressed in a suit and tie don't look like a Chick-fil-A worker totally a little bit but not totally and so what do you do for a living well I'm a pastor oh and three or four people got into conversation about where our church was. I was telling them where our church was. Oh, we didn't know there was a church like that. Do you guys worship? Worship? Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, we worship. How long do you worship? 
And I'm thinking, there's only two answers. Which one is going to make this conversation go longer? I said, well, you know, we worship, you know, and love God. How long? Half hour? Oh, yes. Oh, I love to worship. <laughs> an hour. We worship an hour. An hour and a half. She goes, she said, I'm, I'm sick of my, I like my church. But you know, they just sing one song and then they talk a lot. And then they, they read something and then we, then we leave. I said, well, we, we talk a lot. We, so you'll be accustomed to that. We read a little something, but we don't sing just one song. If we do sing one song, we sing it for a long time. And it's usually us repeating one word over and over and over and over and over and over again. My point is, I didn't have a sign on that said, I need to be asked what I am, what I do, how I do it, and for how long. But that was the questions I was getting there at Chick-fil-A today and should be getting everywhere we go because there should be something different about what is emanating out of us. There should be something that entices questions in our life. And it's done by creating a habit of purity that allows the Spirit of God to be present in our life. Amen. Let's lift our hands. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. We want so very much for our relationship with you, God, to be what you intended it to be. The battle between the spirit man and the flesh man rages on and on, God. Help us do our part. You did your part, God, by filling us with your spirit enabling us and empowering us to walk according to your precepts. Our part, God, is to develop the habits of walking. Help us, Jesus, to develop habits of holiness. Holiness without and holiness within we might be in relationship with you that is powerful, enticing. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I want to be more like you.
want you to grab the hand of the person next to you. Pray this prayer as my wife sings this song. I want to be more like you. I want to be a vessel you were. Help us, Lord God. I want to be more like you, Lord. Jesus, I want to be more like you. Jesus, I want to be a vessel you work for. Love you, Lord God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So this week, let's open up a membership in God's gym. <laughs> and let's begin the habits and developing the habits of working out our spirit man. Saying no to the fleshly man saying yes to the spirit man and reinforcing good habits of Christian disciplines in our life. Amen? Amen.